you were working as a waitress in a cocktail bar when I met you. I picked you out, I shook you up, I turned you around. Turned you into something new. <laughs> Don't you want me, baby? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are floating and scream a celica. My name is Kevin Graham, and as usual on these Tuesday nights, Tales of the Unexpected, I'm joined by Russell Boyce. Russell, how are you on this fine evening? Ah, oh, brilliant, mate. Brilliant. I'm looking forward to those intros now more and more each week. That is a... Uh, and it's been a good variety of lyrics you've chosen so far as well, Kev. So keep that work up, mate. That's brilliant, man. Bit of Human League to kick us off this week. And that's... Aye, uh, that's been a... Uh, that's been some different eras, some different genres. Love it, mate. Love it. Uh, the last two have been the early eighties. Then we had the beat. We had the Beatles the first week. Last week was uh, uh, what's his name? Hit me with your rhythm stick. Uh, hit me with your rhythm, Ian rhythm, Jury. Rhythm, Ian Jury. And this week we've got the Human League. Um, but I think before we get started tonight, Russell, I think I've got to ask you a question. You ever been a waitress in a cocktail bar? <laughs> Well, I used to I used to sing that to some of the barmaids. You were working as a waitress in the crooked arm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, hey, that works. That scans all right. Eh? It doesn't uh, actually scan. That works fairly. Well, eh? Fitted all right, mate. <laughs> do you miss it? Do, do you miss the pub? Oh, I miss loads of aspects of it. I mean, I think I need to be honest and say. I mean, it's a lot of work. To be totally honest to you, I mean, it's something that you would really you need to. Um, you need to you need to be willing to dedicate your life to it, Kev. If you know what I mean. Otherwise, it will no work. It's a six day a week job. Do you know what I mean? Which suited me fine, to be honest. With you. I loved it, but I mean, I think it's um, for the rewards now. They're going down all the time, even though people are probably to make a good living out of uh, having to increase their increase their hours. So I'd recommend anyone to give it a go if they can get a reasonable deal on it. Though, do you know what I mean? Because it Aye. is. Uh, it was a special time, definitely, man. I'm, uh, I'm too lazy for that, man. I'm, I like being in my bed for 10 o'clock and stuff like that. Eh? I'm, not, I'm not a late night owl. Used to be, but no anymore, eh? so uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm not into it. Also, I'm teetotal, eh? so I'm well, not into it. Uh, so folk no, that's get... a bit of a hindrance. I mean, I didn't even usually have had my dinner till after 10 at night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm tucked up in bed with a good book before, just after 10 o'clock at night. Um, well, but before in, in the good old days, as so folk would have called them, I went out on a Thursday night and didn't come back to the Sunday. But that's <laughs> <laughs> that's like the days are long, long gone, man. Long, long gone. <laughs> but we may as well go back to one of the days. Um, so where are we this week? We're well, April two thousand and eight. We are this week, and the the DeLorean has skidded to a halt outside snooker scene. On the Toll Cross Road, do you ken the snooker scene club? On the yeah, Toll yeah, Cross yeah. Road. So it's a Wednesday night, and uh, we're a wee bit early, Russell. So we're going to go in for a couple of pint because I yeah. like a, a couple of wee frames of snooker, eh? And we see, like at this point, well, I'll get a wee snooker reference in here, eh? It looked like Celtic were needing snookers to win the league at this point, eh? Because going into this game, we're playing Rangers on a Wednesday night if nobody's actually worked this out yet. Um, 16, <laughs> 16, 16, for, 16 for April 2008, we're playing Rangers at Celtic Park. Uh, we're four points behind Rangers who have two games in hand. Uh, basically, right. basically due to their quest to become the worst ever side to reach a UEFA Cup final, which, right. sees, which sees them previously cancel games uh, get a couple of games postponed because of the weather. Then just after this game, they bleep for a season extension, which they did get. Then they let this myth come round that they never got a season extension. I mean, has the season ever finished on a Thursday night since that game? No. Since that year. So when has anybody ever heard of the season finishing on a, on a Thursday night? Eh? So they, so they eventually they bleated enough and the SFA and the SPFL, whoever it was at that time, bent over backwards and gave them a season extension. We're going into this game and we have they scored a, a goal at home for three games. Our last team game saw us lose to 10-man Motherwell. Can you guess who got sent off for Motherwell that game? Ex-Rangers player. 
liked signing dodgy things when he signed his name. You've thrown me a bit here, like kind of. I usually I like these questions, eh? Uh, uh, Motherwell player, but uh, Mark Brown? No, no. no. It, it was Bob Malcolm got sent oh, off for. I forgot he played for Motherwell. Uh, it was Bob Malcolm. He got sent off for horse and uh, Massimo Donati up in there. Um, so after that game, I remember that game quite clearly. Eh? Oh, it was a horrible feeling because we thought that was it. We had blew the league at, at mm-hmm. that point. Eh? The team left, sucked off the party booze, and it was really, really horrible. It was absolutely toxic. I, I, I do remember it eh? in like, that game that was like, oh, this is unbelievable. Because the bottom line was, and I say this last week as well, this wasn't their very good Rangers side either. Even though mm. they got to a UEFA Cup final, they were spawny all the way through to that. But I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Eh? <laughs> um, some, some Albert Bramble's already came into the comments. That's Tommy gone 13 year, one time Burns. Neil Lennon had just replaced Tommy uh, in the first team coaching staff at this point. Yes. And as far as I can remember, and I might be wrong here, eh, we weren't it was never disclosed how seriously old Tommy was, eh? It was never it was never like I don't think we were ever told that he was in the the, the last days of no. a life a life where he's actually touched everybody, whoever met him and whoever's got any any heart to do with Celtic whatsoever. Um And beyond. And and beyond and still be and, and still beyond. And eh? beyond. Um so Russell, I've hammered you at snooker a couple of eight, nine breaks. That's about my limit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, about, that's about my limit in snooker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so going into this game, what's your thoughts? What are you thinking about the sixteenth of April two thousand and eight as we as we're walking to Celtic Park? I was in a positive mood for the enough Kev. And I, I remember this season as the mind the gap season, and I had a feeling, I, I, I was very much of the opinion, I don't want to focus on them too much, but I mean, I was of the opinion they were murder. Um, and the, it was just, they were, they were I, I felt they were, they were creaking a wee bit as well. They weren't dominant. It wasn't like this was a team that you thought, wow, we're, ne- we're never going to make it back, even though we're needing snookers, as you rightfully pointed out. I was actually, I had a good feeling uh, to be honest with you, we were going to beat them, and then if it was not my, if my memory serves me right, we played them again. Or is this the second time we played them in the space? No, of three weeks? this is the first time we, we played this them a couple the, of weeks. We, call, we play them a couple of weeks later on a, a, a glorious Sunday afternoon, and that's at Celtic Park as well, isn't it? Uh-huh. Which was unusual. And I always remember thinking, I know they've got the two games, but we've got two games right near each other at home, and I felt we were the better team than them. Uh, I'm, we're walking up to Celtic Park, Kevin. I'm telling you, we are gonna we're gonna do this. There's magic in there. We're gonna beat them tonight. That is definitely what my mindset was. I felt we would win. I mean, you've got you as well. I'll, I'll read out the Rangers team for that night before I go to the Celtic team. But as we right. says, and this is us looking through. As I say, just the green tinted spectacles, right? Of course, but, it is. But you've got Alan McGregor, who I must admit had a great season that season. He carried them all the way in Europe yep. that season. You've got Broadfoot in their back line. You've got Carlos Querla, Davy Weir, who's all, who was about the same age as me at that point, Papak, Papak eh, however you say his name, Christian Daly, Boy Whitaker, Barry Ferguson, Steve Davis, Elbows McCulloch, and somebody called Dartsville. That That's team crazy. is ranked rotten. They are the worst team ever to re- reach a UEFA Cup final. Uh-huh. That, 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 that's the worst squad ever to reach a UEFA Cup final. It's got to be. The Celtic team that night, and we'll talk about this because we're going to talk about the partnerships in this team, so two great partnerships in this team. Uh, the Celtic team that night was a holy goalie, Andreas Hinkle, Gary Caldwell, Stephen McManus, uh, Lee Naylor, Matt Wilson came on for him at half time. Nakamura, Hartley, Hartley Robson, uh, Magidi McDonald, and Venegura Hesselink. On the bench is Matt Brown, strangely enough, the Celtic goalie, uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul, Paul McGowan, Evander Snow, Massimo Donati, and Bobo Baldy is on the bench. And that, that came, when, I, when I read this, I was like, oh. 
when I heard I, 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 I can't remember Bobo being on the bench. Um, yeah, he was in a yeah, he was he was in the, the Twilight Zone by then, wasn't he? I mean, he, he, he was he hadn't, he hadn't featured, I don't think, at all that season. Because even a, I mean, I know uh, the producer Paul is I am very keen on the kits that Celtic wear at the time, and I suppose I think we all do a wee bit. You associate players with certain kits. I always find it odd, right? I'm already away on one. I find it odd sometimes, right? See, when you see footage of Alan Thompson playing in the Nike shirt, mm-hmm. Ken Strachan's first season, or you see uh, Sutton in that shirt, it always throws me. Even though Hartson did a full season in that shirt, he, I still think they look odd in it. Bobo Baldi, that year, that shirt was the one with the, the white collar, wasn't it? It was like the white round neck. It was the white round neck collar. It, it was a funny it was the 40th anniversary of Lisbon top. Aye. I, I can't I remember. Bobo Baldi ever wearing that. that. No, can't remember. I've never seen him in that. Um, so. Aye, I, you're right. I, the guys who I picture wearing that kit are Scott McDonald. Aye. <laughs> Very good, a Hesselink. Totally. Uh, Robson. Paul oh, Hartley, yep. McManus, Caldwell. They're the guys I picture wearing. Hinkle, actually, they picture Hinkle wearing that kit. Eh? But I didn't yes. picture Bobo Baldy wearing that kit. But he's but, still... And the, and the thing is with Baldy there, right? Strachan, this is now his approaching kit. The end of season three of Strachan, isn't it? Aye. This is for three in a row. How is Baldy still there? Because <laughs> he was on, I know he was on a big contract, wasn't he? Um, Aye, it, but I was convinced that had been sewn up. But I must admit, on the Celtic wiki, uh, I always look at the team like when I watch the highlights and then go in there and read the lineup. And the Baldy one at the end, I kind of, th- I actually thought they might have got it wrong. So uh, <laughs> I, honestly, but, 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 maybe they have got it wrong, but I don't think so. I, 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 I need to check the Celtic wiki after this. But I remember him playing a game at Tannadice under Strachan when he had been like ostracised for. Like mm-hmm. months and months, and he ended up playing at Tanadice because I was, uh, and I think that was a Christmas game. Uh, I, I, I don't You're know. No, mind, uh, I can't remember. I was in Lockie before that game, so I might have imagined it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I don't again. Anyway, there's fifty eight thousand here, and the referee's Kenny Clark, but we'll come to Kenny Clark later. Um, but we had not scored a goal against Rangers for one year. We had not beaten Rangers for one year when this game kicked off. But the tone of the game was set right for the off. Uh, we Stratton had paired Barry Robson and Paul Hartle in the middle and it was working yep. a treat because basically we needed to dig out results. Yep. It would keep us in the title race or at least put pressure on a Rangers team that you've already quite rightly says looked like they were flapping by this point. Yep. They, they, they looked like they were abs- absolutely flapping by this point. And we looked like... On paper, we had the better side. We had the better players. Uh, but this Rangers team had found a way to boringly win, a formula to boringly win. They would play for draws, they would go one nothing up and they would sit in defence and they would they would grind days out. I mean, they were as boring as, as they were as, as ugly as their coutums, actually. <laughs> they, they, were a, they, were a, they were a horrible team to watch at that time, eh? I mean, I think the whole of Europe hated them at that point and didn't they want them to have any success. But the game kicks off, eh? Within nine seconds, there's a high ball and Barry Robson clatters into, uh, clatters into Christian Daly. Swings an elbow, eh? That's is, uh, is, is an elbow, eh? And, he, and then Robson flattens the wannabe Stone Roses guitar playing indie curly-haired freak that he is and like Daly gets up uh, Daly Daly gets up absolutely angry and I I, I reckon when you actually see it on the telly now I reckon his hair starts going curlier (laughs) as he gets up because he's that angry he goes a bit sideshow Bob eh? and he's he's fuming and and, and he's fuming at uh, Kenny Clark for no gain for, for no gain the free kick and that set a tone that night because Celtic Park went mental after that. We went, oh, we're up for this tonight. As I say, there was a, a myth going about at that point that Gordon Stratton couldn't beat Walter Smith. We That's had to right. beat them for a year. We couldn't, we couldn't, score, couldn't score a goal against them. Eh? Just when I mentioned Christian Dale, do you remember him when he broke into the Dundee United team and they pictured him playing the acoustic guitar and he was like a sort of 
like Man- Manchester 1990 Indy Do you not remember? I don't remember that. I remember one of my first football memories is is Dundee United winning the Scottish Cup, funnily enough, because it would be about seven or eight then. And I, I remember it was him who it, it came off the post and it went it came out to Brewster. It was Christian Daly who was busting up the left wing for Dundee United. And uh, aye, that's like that's how I remember it. But he had the, he had the curly hair night. He must have played about forty three thousand positions, Kyle. He did. He, he must have played for about forty three thousand teams as well. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of other other football players that played the guitar. Uh, Stephen Thompson. Stephen Thompson. Obviously, uh, James Allen was one as well. Las Vegas. Leighton uh, Baines. Aye, Leighton Baines. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, our producer Paul comes in and says Pat McMahon. I don't know who Pat McMahon was. Um, what was the guy that played for Celtic that ended up going to Motherwell? Jim O'Brien. Jim O'Brien was another that one that, 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 that played. That he played. But what game did Christian Daly play for Celtic? Christian Daly played for Celtic once in his career. When did he play for Celtic? Must have been right at the beginning. I'm going to say 1990. Mm, you're 10 year out. He played for Celtic on the 16th of May 2000 when, Cel- when Celtic travelled to Anfield for the Ronnie Moran testimonial. Jason McAteer also played for Celtic that night because Kenny Douglas was a Celtic manager and Celtic were uh, ravaged by injuries. So Kenny phoned Blackburn. Christian Daly was at Blackburn and uh, McAteer was at Blackburn and they played for Celtic as trialists that night. That's some knowledge, Kev. That's amazing. I was there. I was I was there right. that night. We got gubbed four one, and they had recently just built the Anfield Road stand, and they had to shut it after the Celtic fans had been in it because it was moving too much. That that, right. that is a that is a true story. I've actually wrote a short story about the Ian Rush testimonial. It's on the Axon website. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll put a link into the the comments after I this and that. Uh, uh, it's, it's on the Axon website. It's about the Ronnie Marat. It's about Ian Rush testimony of him. We got beat six nothing. See, got gone to Anfield, wasn't he? Was, was there a good no. thing for us? Eh? That was a good day. That eh, the Ronnie Moran testimonial. But it was always quite strange for me um, seeing Christian Daly playing for Rangers after I'd seen him playing on a Celtic top. I get it. I get it. I would never, ever, ever have known that. That's quality. I know. I know. Good knowledge. Eh, one again, it's one of the things though that I thought I had imagined for years because of the because of the like the the messiness of the day, shall we say. It was one of these things when you think back on it, you go, Did I actually imagine Christian Daly playing for Celtic? Did, <laughs> I, actually, did I actually imagine that? But ah, it, turned, it, true. It, it turned out to be true. Um no, twenty minutes gone. And we break the deadlock with, for me, one of the most famous goals in Celtic's recent history. Gary Caldwell took on his uh, Beckenbauer heat and played the ball forward to the genius, which was Shunzuki Nakamura. Nakamura had been, he was getting, marked, Nakamura was getting a bit of abuse in this game. Well, not in this game, but for his previous performances well, against, yeah, I remember. Uh, against Rangers. Eh? Folk were saying he was a bottle merchant against the Brutes for Govan. So he stretches to control his ball with his left foot, and it's a big stretch. I mean, my, I, when I was watching the highlights again last night, my hamstring nearly pounded watching him actually uh-huh. tra- 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 the boy. Uh, how is he controlling that whilst he's doing that? Eh? Uh, he controls the ball. Then he's that- ni- he controls it, then his next kick with his left foot. He sends us, he melts the ball into another dimension. And it looks like it's took about 15 psychedelics as it swerves out, out, out the road uh, past Alan McGregor into the back of the net. The place goes absolutely nuts. Where, where I sat at Celtic Park, uh, it's at the corner, uh, section 412, eh? Mm-hmm. And see, when he hit that that night, I'm like, wow. It's one of, for me, it's one of the one of his greatest goals was one of the yeah, greatest goals I've ever seen a Celtic Rangers game. No, oh, I I mean no two ways about it. And do you know something as well about it was it was 
we speak about this with the with the maybe the Celtic team they're out. It's someone make take their own responsibility in making something happen. Because we need something to happen, right? This is as you say, we're needing snookers as it is, we're in last chance saloon, whatever you want to call it. We need something to happen here. And I thought he just took ownership, took responsibility as the guy most capable of doing something out of the ordinary. He did something out of the ordinary. Um the strike itself is mind boggling how he gets that sort of deviation of the ball. The movement itself is a joke. If you watch McGregor, he doesn't actually dive to the right hand side. Because he's kind of actually took a step slightly to the left, and then he's watching it move, and he's thinking it's coming straight down. He's sort of straight down him, so he's dive. He's kind of, I don't know how the, a goalie would do it, but he's kind of just dived up the way. He's not really yeah. went to his right at all, and then he's realising at the end, oh my, that's now swerving. So it's it's went like oh it was it was insane. I mean, Bobby Carlos would have said, "Tackers, mate, <laughs> that's, that's how you put swerving a ball." Um, I and I just think that start to the game, and you combine that with the Robson challenge, the face they open him, the atmosphere generated, and then magic happening. And do you know something? I'm actually surprised that it, 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 you know, it became a a game that we only won so late on. We'll get get to that, but I think it had all the makings then of a, a three 0 four 0 I think at that point at the day, uh, nah, we, is what I mean. we were on top in the first 20 minutes and it, it took that moment of absolute genius to break to, to break the deadlock. Eh? But again, we were played into Rangers' hands. They wanted to sit and a draw was good enough for them. They, they, they were quite happy to come out of Celtic Park with a draw that night, as I say. No, that's we, won't, true. We, won't, we won't get on to that. But when I... I, had, I think I watched that, that that game again. Well, that goal again about four or five times last day, and I'm going. I still haven't got a clue how he's managed to do it. No, and and it's no one. It's not like it's like that. What was the name of that board that they used in the African World, uh, the South African World Cup? Was it the Jabulani or something like that? Uh, which uh, flew everywhere. Eh? You're talking about this is a heavy ball, and right. and he's hit it as as you say. It made it made Alan McGregor look stupid. Aye. But it's one. Uh, it makes Alan McGregor look stupid. But you go, you shouldn't feel stupid, Alan, because no. uh, it's one of the things you're never saving that. You are never no. saving that. And and uh, and a month for Sundays. We're going at one. We're going at one and a half time. Do you, right? Do you think that's Nakamura's best goal? It's that or the Man United free kick, isn't it? And again, do you know what I liked about Nakamura was, see when you look at his best goals, I always loved the one at Rugby Park as well. Uh, and I'm now thinking of one he scored at Tanadice, which is quality as well, which is actually thought and play. I really liked that as well. Mm-hmm. But the thing was with Nakamura, you look at that one, you look at the Man United free kick, and you look at the, what was the other one? Uh, the Rugby Park one. The big moments too. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I mean? It's not this... But all of, and I, I couldn't agree more. I remember the chat being that he's no done it in, in, in a Glasgow derby or whatever. Did I say old firm? I mean, like it's, uh, and see when he, uh, when he, when he takes, when he gets the pressure right on him and we need something special to happen, I just think he had a, an amazing coolness personified. Just he was able to remove himself from like the situation. He was mm-hmm. able to take himself out of that and just, focus on what it is he's got to do. And that's that goal from open play um, against against Rangers, right? And then you're looking at the other two are set pieces. So that's total variation as well. Do you know what I mean? And I just think, is it the best when he's scored? I think if we'd, if we'd won the game 1-0, you might say it, but I think the United one will probably just edge it for most people. I'm, I'm not sure. No, I, I, for me, it's, it's, it's his best goal for open play. If... Yeah. That but wasn't then, a question. I know it wasn't a question. <laughs> no, it wasn't his question. <laughs> his goal at Rugby Park's got special connotations as well. And the, that that night, the the Van der Sar, I mean, he done Van der Sar twice, and in, in that Champions League group stage. I know. Uh, the, uh, for me, the one against Man United is utterly superb, but then it's overshadowed by Big Boric's penalty save. Which the place goes utterly nuts again, eh? Um, 
I can, it's, it's been a privilege to actually see Nakamura. Uh, we spoke about this last week when we were talking about Bellamy. And we could not, I can not imagine myself to support a life no seeing Nakamura and a Celtic top. So I'm, 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 I'm privileged to actually have seen Nakamura and Bellamy and a Celtic top. So, no, yeah, I agree. You've got to appreciate good things, eh? Yeah, I've got to no, appreciate I agree, the good things. I agree. Eh? It's one at half time, and we're going to go into half time because the game sort of petered out toward, towards half time. The second half hot's up right enough, eh? But, <laughs> but this game has got so many moments that to, to this, this day still bring a massive fire, massive smile to my face. It was one of, it was one of these dramas of a, a Celtic Rangers game, eh? Do you remember what happened at half time of this tie? Go for it. The Green Brigade, who were two years old at this point, mm-hmm. produce a banner. Uh, produce a banner at half time, uh, which is just along from me. And I'll, I'll tell you the story. I must have got to say the story because I, I didn't really like but I, I'll tell the story anyway. Right? Tell the story, Kev. The night before, a wee guy from Stirling who was in the Green Brigade phoned me and he says, look, we're doing a banner display at half time and we, I know that you sit up there. Can you give us a hand because we're looking for guys that sit up there to actually drop this, drop the banner. And I'm like... I no problem, pal. I'll give you a hand. So I was told to meet under. I can't remember what stairway it was. So I went doing it half time, met under the stairway. Just as I met, there was, there was about eight or nine years all there, eh? And just just as I met them, I got this panic because the boy says to me, oh, "Oh, that's good. You'll need to cover your face in that." And I'm going, "What the hell's on this banner? I'm fair. I'm I, I'm I'm in my thirties. Got." An all right job. I says, what the hell's on this banner? What have I got my uh, what, what, what the hell have I got myself in here? Eh? <laughs> so so we walked so we walked up eh? and I'm still gone. I'm asking guys, I went, do you care what's on this banner? And boys have gone, no, no, we didn't care what's on that saying. I'm like, oh no, here we go. So we get right down the front. And, and and everybody everybody's along along the along the front. Everybody's gone. What he's doing, lads? I'm going. Oh, but we're doing a banner, blah blah blah. And I'm going. I'm shitting myself by this point. Eh? And I'm going. I don't care what's on this. So I, I've got I've got a a green and white Henley's hoodie on. So I shoved my hood up. I had a scarf on and I covered my face with the scarf. I'm going. I'm not getting this. And we dropped it. Eh? And the place went absolutely mental. It was a Scotland shame banner. Eh? Oh the, yeah, uh, the, the, the Scot the, the Scotland shame banner with it, but I couldn't see it because oh, you know, oh, <laughs> and, and, and the whole the whole crowd uh, goes absolutely mental, and I'm going, I still didn't ken what's I still didn't ken what's actually on this. <laughs> so I went, nice. and it wasn't it wasn't until it, it wasn't until after it. All, all I remember is the place going absolutely mental, and the guys who had done it, the boys that were in uh, the boys who were in the in, in the Green Brigade, they, they were going, "Wow, this is magic!" And they were all hugging each other after it and that. And what I remember about that day uh, when we when we when we had done it, or when the guys for the Green Brigade had done it, a steward came up and folded the banner and says, "Ah, you can get it. We've, we've got a cupboard in the stairs." <laughs> he said, "You'll get it in the cupboard in the stairs. I need to get away." <laughs> so if you, if you look at that if you look at that picture I'll, I'll maybe post the picture there's a picture that's took from just below it and you can actually see just where the arrow is you'll see a green and white hoodie that's me <laughs> that, that is me but as I say I, that's I, really, I crap myself I must admit when I when I actually re, when I realised I didn't ken what was on it and gone, what? And the place is <laughs> going nuts. <laughs> the place has gone absolutely nuts. Uh, aye, so that that's my that, that was my wee bit. That was only the time I've ever been an ultra. Aye, well, <laughs> that's only the time. The, I've, that's only the time I've ever done it. You playing? I know, but but I get that. I think you're already fearing the worst, and then you've done it, and then it dawns on you. This isn't over yet because I actually don't know what it says. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're thinking it'll take two minutes, just unfurl it, and that's it, job done. But then a new wave of panic must have came over you when you're like, what, do, what does it say? 
That's brilliant. <laughs> Aye, oh, it's, uh, it, it, it was some buzz. I'm not going to lie, it was some buzz, but then I saw it took me about 15 minutes to, come to, back to, in. Some, to somebody to tell me, like, by the way, that's what was on it. <laughs> oh, it was quite funny, and that's that's weeks that's weeks before Manchester day. That's weeks before they went down and totaled Manchester, eh? So that's right. The, oh. See what I remember as well. The rivalry was hot then, though, wasn't it? Like it was at the atmosphere, you know, that game, and there was another one as well. I remember I think it was Mark Wilson that scored around the similar, yeah, a couple of years later, or whatever. But I think it was still Walter Smith in charge at them, and they still had a lot of hammer throwers then. Do you know what I mean? It was. It, it could it, it, that could have boiled over that game definitely when you look back. Eh? Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean the, the banner itself. I think they've seen it this season. Eh, uh, I, I think they've seen it this season that the the Celtic support have got a sense of humour, and even though that banner was making a point, there was the fact that none of the Rangers fans could see it up the top tier, so they didn't know what the Celtic fans were like going going oh, mental yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And there was just a big arrow. It was the biggest wind up uh, like uh, I had a I had a message but it was done in a jokey way where it was a it was a wind up, eh? It was an absolute wind up. Um I that that's my wee part in the Green Brigade history. This <laughs> is my only part in the Green Brigade oh, history. <laughs> Love after it. that, after that, I realised that uh, having a, an ultra with the fear of what was actually on banners probably wasn't a good look. So my, my days of being an ultra were, were uh, I, I retired after that. <laughs> I retired after that. It was a uh, short but successful career, Kev. A short yes. but a glittering career, mate. <laughs> I know, I know. We're going to the setting half. Um, and as was typical with the spawny tadpoles at that point, they equalise after an honest mistake. Daly takes takes out Barry Robson in the middle of the pitch and Kenny Clark waves play on. The ball falls to Nacho Novo. Now, Nacho Novo was the ultimate wannabe panto villain. He wanted to be hated and he'd done everything to try and be hated. But really, he was more like a widow twanky eh, for us to mock it and laugh. <laughs> uh, he, just, he just became a comedy figure rather than a hate figure. He scores after Mark Wilson slips um, and he somehow manages to score for the, for the right-hand side of the box. Yeah. For for me, when you actually watch the goal again, the holy goal is at fault. The holy goal should not get... Should, uh, not, uh, should not be actually getting beat with that shot for there. I think the holy goalie's positioning uh, p- positioning's wrong. What do you think of that? Well, I think that is that, that that's a good point. I also think, in fairness to to the striker, I think he has caught Boric off guard. I don't think you're expecting him to ping it with such accuracy for there. Um, it's mm-hmm. not one of his forties was scoring. Long range, well, not long range, but you know what I mean. Distant shots with pinpoint accuracy is not something I would associate with Nacho Novo in the slightest. And um, he was just a wee pest, you know what I mean? Who he'd still probably scored a fair amount of goals or whatever. But I think, I think Boric at times was probably just too aware of who had the ball at that, in that position and maybe just not treated it seriously enough and got his got his feet and his feet and foot and. Uh, right, it is a tidy finish and face, but it is really accurate. Do you know what I mean? There's no two ways about that. When it when it goes in, I mean, it, it, what he did hit the only bit he could aim for to score. But I, I think, I think Arthur Boric could have definitely, if he'd been positioned better, could have saved it. He, he would have been disappointed at that one. He would have been, eh? Um, Novo, eh? He, Novo dined out for years on this sort of persona that he gave himself, that he knocked us back and he signed for them and he had the Rangers Sabuto team in 1972 because he watched them winning the Cup Winners Cup. All that rubbish. Mm-hmm. And that. I've never met a Spaniard to Kenzo Rangers, huh? unless you've, unless the fans have wrecked their city during a European trip or something <laughs> like that. But he'd done a job. He, he always seemed to be a pain in the neck against us. And he was always just, he was a pantomime villain. He was really a pantomime villain, but I think we had the last laugh with, last laugh with him. As I say, he, was, he made, became a joke figure. Oh, then, and then a hated figure, eh? Aye. 
I just think with that goal as well, though, there was, uh, from my memory at the time and watching it back, obviously, this week, it was like, there was a feeling like they might just scrape this somehow. Do you know what I mean? Because it's what, as you say, that's what they'd done all season that year. And you just felt when that goal went in. And uh, as I say, that first half, place was rocking, momentum's with them. Brilliant moment at half time with the banner. Optimism's high, and you're brought crashing down to back to reality. Do you know what I mean? And, and I felt it would, I just felt that Celtic at that in that match were well, a better team than them, but yet somehow still you're finding yourself level pegging. Do you know what I mean? It's frustrating. They, 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 it was they, had done it, frustrating. they had done it all season, basically. And they go one nothing up, and you're going, This game now suits them because they'll just go back into their shape and do what they've, what they've been doing so well for the whole of that season. But on the 70th minute comes for me another memorable moment. Uh, not because of what happens, because actually what happens has got a bit of regret for me. Uh, and I'm not talking about Scott McDonald missing the penalty kick. It's when Nakamura picks the ball up on the... On the the right hand side, and he curls a great shot into the what has gone into the top corner. It would have been another great goal to add to the first, the goal that he scored in the first half. And, and see when I've seen that, that's what I'm trying to say, Kev. This was a guy who, at two now occasions in the match, has took responsibility and you, you, has complete faith in his own ability to do that. And I think we need to see more of that. Do you know what I mean? From the, from the the current team, there's bags of talent in there, but you're that killer instinct, I just felt Nakamura was taking ownership for the for the what what was to be the winning result. And again, moment of absolute magic as you say that that second attempt was again, I mean it should have should have stood and like you say, you'd have then been debating which one was better. <laughs> you would have been exactly it goes one way, it goes the other, goes it's just it's just that, that he's get he's getting bend way inside curl on that one. The other ones mm. we swerve going like that, and we'd be debating right now what's better the inside than I can move the outside. <laughs> you know what I well, mean? He can, he can maybe give uh, Carlos Queller a bit of credit because he knew Nakamura was shooting. He was like, <laughs> this, this has gone in this top corner, I better get there. Eh? And I wish they didn't tip it over the bar because, as you I see, know. we've been talking about two fantastic goals by a player in a Celtic Rangers game but then if Queller has they punched the ball across the bar we would never have got the best commentary that you've ever heard on a Celtic game in your life do you ken the commentary I'm talking about? no? go for it I can't, think of, I can't like, remember the line do, do you remember in the, when the internet was starting there used to be a thing called Justin TV Yes, that rings a bell, yeah. yeah. So on Justin TV, there used to be a Raj who used to call, who used to commentate on Celtic games. A right Celtic mm-hmm. fan, right? And he would be over the top in that. So he, he was commentating on this game. He, he, he was commentating on this game, eh? So Queller punches the ball over the bar, right? And the boy's got the boy. The boy starts shouting. He's got to go. He's got to go. Yes, get it right up. He's got to go. And he shouts, "Carlos Queller, Scotland's Player of the Year last year, as new a dick." <laughs> and, and, and in between it, he's got like, I get it up, yeah, get it up, yeah. And he's shout, he's shouting, shouting along, yeah. Eh? Then, then he comes, then he, then he comes out with another classic line, eh? And he goes, I if in doubt, cheap it, cheap. No, oh, sorry, if in doubt, cheat it out. It's a Rangers way. Brilliant. <laughs> it's I will actually. It's still on Twitter. And I will, I will post it. It's one of the best bits of commentary, absolutely. Oh, I've never heard that. Oh, see, when you hear it, Russell, you will, I, I did the day of justice. <laughs> I, did, right. I did actually do it justice. Right. The, the, the boy is like, the, the boy goes right over the top, but it's just that thing with Scotland's player of the year last year, but he's new a dick. <laughs> <laughs> How can you think of that man all off the cuff watching the, all, watching this game? I often wonder what, what actually happened to him because he just seemed to disappear as quick, quick, quick as he appeared. Eh? Um, it used to be just on TV. And I think he used to have, 
Every I remember that. the name Justin TV, like. I do remember it. The boy had his own channel, and I can't remember. I, I can't remember what the guys, the, the, the boy's channel was called. Eh? Um, McGrory says the one that does the famous commentary on the Barca game. I, I can't. I can't. I can't remember the the Barca game one, but I always remember this one with Queller, uh, which is the boy was a bit of a legend for about a season or two. Eh? Then he's just completely disappeared. So if anybody in the comments knows knows what happened to him. Uh, I would like to get him on here and interview him. <laughs> I think it would be quite a, I think it'd be quite a dude to actually interview. Um, so we get a penalty kick. Laura Bradburn, who uh, Justin TV became Twitch. I think there you go. I wonder if that we learn something new every day. Both. That that used to be the go to when you were looking for streams. You used to go to Justin TV. Wow, that, 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 that used to be that used to be the goal, eh? So Skippy misses a penalty kick. Um, that is a decent save, um, but what I've got to say is McGregor's almost at the six year box by the time by the, by the time uh, McDonald actually hits the ball. And these days, a VAR it would it would have been a uh, it would have been like retaken because he's yeah, that yeah, for, yeah. because he's that for. Uh, He's that far off his line, it's frightening, eh? But as the guy says, if in doubt, get the ref to cheat it out. That's the Rangers' philosophy, as somebody's just picked up on there. Sean Laird's, if in doubt, cheat your way out. That's the Rangers' philosophy. That's what the guy actually says. <laughs> so, Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. <laughs> so they're, they're doing to 10 men. They're doing to 10 men, and this, new, this game suits our boring rivals. They can just sit and they've got the draw that they want. We've missed a penalty kick. Our heads have went down. You're talking about a team here who the they get to a UEFA Cup semi final a couple of weeks later against Fiorentina, and the, and the Fiorentina manager says they played for penalty kicks in the first thirty seconds. You know, uh-huh. he, he says, he says oh, they were playing for penalties right for the start, and and they, and they got through. And uh, I'm sure. Game. I'm sure it was against Fiorentina. Me and my flatmate at the time were watching it, right? And cut Broadfoot Phil Shives twice. <laughs> a European semi-final. <laughs> Have you? Can't even throw a ball in, man. It's like this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I, always, um, I always remember that two Phil Shives. I'm sure it was the European semi-final. You're going. It's just a red neck, isn't it? <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> So, we're going into the 91st minute, yep. right? And their fans are celebrating the draw. They're singing that they're going to win. hee ho eh? And, like, they're doing the bouncy. They're telling us to go home. I think Gary Caldwell again decides to stroll across, stroll across the halfway line. Like, he's another Beckenbauer moment, eh? He thinks he's a liberal. The, the, a the, a Berenzi, aye. Aye, a Berenzi. And it, he gets the ball about 30, 35 yards out and he crosses it into the box. Uh, we skip it, out jumps uh, Whitaker. And if you actually watch the footage, Wh- Wh- Whitaker claims that it's a foul. <laughs> He's flapping about the place say, saying it's uh, an absence. He, was, out, he was way out of position. McDonald was a good yard and a half away from him. That's how McDonald's winning that header. He's not picked up McDonald properly at all. But uh, you're right. The arms right. are going there. The, arm, the arms are going there. Exa- it's so uh, over exaggerated what Whitaker did there. It's so like, it's it is it's it's comedy sketch material, man. But but uh, there you go. If in doubt, cheat it out. Eh? Try and get right. try and get try and get everything that you can. Um, but then imagine imagine getting out jumped by Scott McDonald. <laughs> you must have knew that you're going to get you're going to get a you're going to get a roasting in the dressing room for that. What, what do you mean? Right. Oh, that, right. That wee Australian who's five foot done no, out no, jump chain. I know. <laughs> they header the ball back across. And there we've got he headers it back across the face of the goal and big Jan Venegura Hesselink with it to score with a diving header. I passed uh, Neil Alexander by this point because Alan McGregor goes off injured after the penalty kick. Yeah. Um I didn't think we've seen him I I didn't think we see enough uh, diving headers in the game but this is a classic diving header into the back of the net eh? and if you think the place went bonkers eh, when Nakamura scored it goes utterly bonkers when Jan Venegura 
Hesselink scores, eh? And it doesn't finish there. I mean, the Celtic part's gone mental, the players are gone mental and all that. And they can't hack it. Davy Weir strokes Gary Caldwell. Him and Caldwell get into a fight uh, and a Stramash starts. But what's really good about when you watch the footage now, I, I, did, I didn't remember seeing the footage. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think, like... He didn't. He didn't see the. I didn't see the footage of the thing because I was too busy jumping about. But the whole team go into the scrumash, and and who's who's the first member of the coaching staff on the pitch? Neil Lennon. Neil Lennon. That's the first <laughs> member of the coaching staff on the pitch, and he's he's throwing bodies away left, right, and centre. And uh, what they can son in hindsight, uh, hindsight is like, I think that that's the moment that league was won when you look back on it, because you can tell they flapped by that point. They can tell that they didn't fancy coming back to Celtic Park in a couple of weeks. Uh, their, their pants are beginning to flap like a bed sheet in, in a gale man on a, on a line. Eh? And the fact is, it's a perfect time to get your first win in a year out of them, because it puts that doubt in their mind that, yes. they, have to come, that they have to come back. Yeah, it's, they, removed, uh, it's removed the myth that Strachan can't beat Smith is taking that out of the equation and I think secondly as well I just think knowing there was going to be another one in two weeks and realistically the Celtic players are going to look at the lengths they had to go to to try and get a draw with us that night we were always going to beat them in two weeks time after I think you're right I mean if you're looking at a game in isolation as to when a pendulum can swing or when a league title can be won. Ah, it's up there, eh? I mean, that was... you know, that they, I felt they'd given us everything they had that night um, and they were willing to go to any length that they possibly could. And I think you're right about the Stramash. The fact was their kids had gone. And once you see all these... See, once you add all that up and you go, you've got defenders diving in top corners uh, getting sent off. You're... you're, you're uh, you're then conceding late goals because you're you can't even out jump because you're panicking that much. So we're seeing uh, we're seeing desperation, we're seeing panic in the defence, and then we're seeing a uh, loss of the heat with a with a stramash or whatever you want to call it. And you're now going that is a team on the ropes. I definitely and the momentum was where's Kevin? Mm-hmm. And why was the momentum where's because? Gordon Stratton had found a couple of partnerships in that team to try and get us over the line. And I think the first partnership that we've got to have a look at, we'll have a look at the partnership with the goal. Uh, Venegura, Hesselink and Skippy up front. Now, they, they, were, they, they were a classic, like, they were a little classic, and large. little and large pair. They, they, they're probably the last, they're probably the, the, the last little and large pairing that we've had. And I'm trying to think there, have we had one since? Because we don't usually have pairing of strikers up front now. They're usually wide players or like uh, three up front or 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 false false nines, false tens. Patrick Kamalas, who knows what what they're meant to be, eh? But this was was a partnership, eh? And they scored 51 goals between them that season. Eh... Hesselink got 21, McDonald got 30. So it shows you... Good numbers, uh, eh? It shows you they got good numbers, eh? I remember when we signed uh, Venegura Hesselink. We signed him in August 2006 for yep. three and a half million quid for PSV. Yep. Um, and I thought we were getting a player. I mean, he had scored yep. 73, 73 players, uh, 73 goals for PSV. And he had scored quite a few in the Champions League. Because he scored against he, Leeds United, he scored against him, sure. And it was his name that you noticed, Venegura Hesseling. You go, no, oh, there's that big fella scored again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's because his name, the longest name in world football uh, at that time. Eh? And so you're getting a player for the Netherlands who's scored at a high level. Where you he was a Dutch international at this point as well. Eh? You wouldn't but, get a Dutch international coming to Scotland now. Not at uh, what age would he have been then as well? Because he was born, what, 78? So he would have been, what, 2008? I mean, he'd have been 29, 30 then. And when did he sign 2006? So we'd have got him at 27, 28? Peak years? 
peak years peak for a football years, player. That's a national uh, sign, Come on. Aye. Too lightly, is it, Kev, these days? Definitely not. Uh, not, not lightly, no. And, and right, he was limited as a player. We're, we're not yeah. going to deny. We're not going to deny that he wasn't even a. He was the a Larson, and he wasn't even a Van Hooydonk. But he was a. For me, he was a typical Gordon Stratton signing. He was a functional player who worked, who worked for his teammates, and I think his partnership with McDonald proved that that when he had a wee foil alongside him, he, he was. He was okay. He wasn't mobile. He was injury prone, but he scored some big goals for us. Doesn't yep. make him a great player, but I think McDonald and Hesslink are remembered for this run in this season. I think this is the season for me. If, if you're mentioning Hesslink and Skippy, this is the season I remember them as a, as a partnership up front. I think Scott McDonald, um, I remember when he signed, he signed for 750 grand and he was sort of being expected to be the sort of third choice, impact sub sort of strike. He wasn't, meant to, he wasn't signed to be playing week in, week out, I don't think. That was in my opinion of him anyway, that he was going to be signed to be first team regular at, uh, at Celtic. But what I always liked about McDonald's was he had that, that, that streak to him where he, his desire or his commitment to the game or his, or his, his you know, I know he was a, uh, you know, folk used to comment on his body shape and that being a wee bit bigger or a wee bit larger or whatever, but I also thought he was one of those folk who put his cell about. Um, he just seemed to get it, and I think he he always played above his cell. Do you know what I mean? I think for the, for the, I thought you were just cutting me off there, Kevin. I thought you were <laughs> enough there, mate. I thought, fair enough. <laughs> uh, I, I think for his, I think for whatever he lacked in ability, shall we say, McDonald. And he did have ability. I'm not saying he didn't, by the way. But I think he made up for more in attitude, application, and just trying to, just being like, just a competitor, fierce, fierce competitor. Um, he, I mean, no one envisaged him having the career at Celtic that he did. You know, the, you you look at the goal at Ibrox when he's chested it down ball. Mm-hmm. You look at him scoring against Man United, Milan, um, big teams, big goals. He was not, my personal take anyway was when we signed him, that I would never see him getting goals of such magnitude like that. And you know the thing is as well, you've, you've had the, the Cohenies to take the penalty, fair play, you've missed it, but you make up for it. And he, rather than being, a lot of players, what you'd find, right, see after they've missed that penalty, what they do is they want to make amends, right? They want to make amends. That ball comes over and he sends a daft head up to the near post that gets saved easy. He doesn't. He kept his cool with that header across goal. It was I, smart. You've summed it up there, Russell. We paid seven hundred grand for him, and he got the number seven. seven and he got the set the number seven jersey. And you were right about his body shape because, like, his ass was that big. It had his own weather, weather system, <laughs> and, and he, 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 he always looked that angry. And yep. do, you get, do you get the players called him Stephen Hawkins? That was his nickname. Because he was a know-it-all. They, they say, I that we know-it-all, so they called him Stephen Hawkins. Is that right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. That's brilliant. Who was the manager at Brunlum at a British football? Oh, I could get this. Southampton. Uh, Dave Jones? Gordon Stratton. Gordon Stratton. Oh, right. All right, Gordon Stratton brought him from, this is a great name, Gypsland Falcons, an Australian, signed him for Southampton in 2000. Wow, is that when he joined them, 2000? I wasn't sure was, if it was Dave uh, Stratton, I should have got that, why else uh, St- Stratton, aye, and when he left Celtic, where did they go? Middlesbrough, with Gordon Stratton as a manager. Again, uh, that, that, that's So it showed you we Stratton loved him. As a, as a player, eh? I mean, more can what he done, more can what he done in two thousand and five, eh? And there was a bit of there was a bit of a, a protest when we were go, going to sign him and that. But I think he repaid us. I think he gave us enough memories to actually more than repaid re, 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 repay him, eh? It repaid him. Big Hesselink, I've noticed a couple of folk laughing. That says it cost me a fortune to get Big Hesselink's name on his jersey. Um, it would actually, at the time, it cost you fifteen pound to get his name, get the full name on the back of his shirt. And it wasn't a vessel, it wasn't a Jan Venegur 
of Hesselink. The right English translation was Jan Venegur or Hesselink. It wasn't off because basically the two names had equal society weight in the Netherlands. And when I've got it down here, no on, way. Uh, so so rather than choose between them, the two. So in the 17th, 17th century, two farming families in an area of Holland intermarried. Does that mean they were related? I don't know, but the royal, I don't know. But both, the, both the Venegur and Hesselink names carried equal social weight, so rather than choose between them, they chose to use both. Often Dutch actually translates to or in English. So his right name was Jan Venegur or Hesselink. There no way! There you go. That's, that's... I can't believe that. Right? So, My whole life has been a lie, Kevin. <laughs> oh, he, he had a great song as well, Jan Venegur. Eh? Uh, as I, like as I said, he, he, he gave us big moments. He scored a goal at won the league at Tanadice. Uh, and, and I know some folk will say, oh, he was a lazy, he was a big coup, he done this and he done that, he was the greatest. Eh? But I just want my Celtic strikers to score goals and give me moments to remember. And I think him and Skippy done that. <laughs> and, oh, that, and, and that's and that that's all we can ask. Eh? We've mentioned this before on on Scream of Celica, eh? but one of the most, one of the reasons that we won the league that season was a guy that we signed in January two thousand and eight, a twenty nine year old who had missed a shot at the big time, but for for the four months the, the rest of that season, he proved an inspired signing, and for me. He cemented his place in, in folklore, and that was Barry Robson. Barry yep. Robson was signed for Dundee United in, in that January, and I, and I remember and, and I remember folk like saying, "What are we signing Barry Robson for? He's twenty nine. If we had not signed Barry Robson, we're no one in the league that season." Hundred percent. That, that, that's how and that's how important Barry Robson was to us that oh, season. Yeah. He was amazing. And you know, it's funny because I was actually buzzing that we signed him. That's the honest truth. Uh, the, re- the reason for that is, see, whenever we played Dundee United, I used to hate it when he took the corners. I used to hate it. Like, Look how he hits that. But he used to flip it so nicely in his left peg. It used to cause his bother. You always remember, it used to get mm-hmm. the fear if he was putting a cross in. And then he was obviously getting his reputation for scoring free kicks and for scoring uh, sort of long-range digs. He was very much someone ready-made for the first team at that point. Now, just didn't have the glitz of being Scottish football's most expensive player like Scott Brown and didn't have the didn't have the glamour of coming from AC Milan that Massimo Donati had. But, by God, did he have every single other attribute you could want, I thought, for what was... The best way to describe it was that running was a sleeves-rolled-up job, Kev. Definitely. Get the sleeves rolled up, and there's two guys you hung your hat on to do that Hartley and Robson in the midfield. From the, I was obsessed with both of them at that period because eh? I just thought they are, they, it's so obvious they need to play every week. Like, it has to be them too. Again, it's so easy just to say expressions like they got it and all this stuff. But again, it's one of those ones where I felt they took responsibility, they took ownership of, right. We're in the trenches here when we need to go to war. You can can your heart on me to, to do that for you. And what I mean, what I lack in pretty passing or pretty dribbling or whatever, I'm going to make up for it in effort. I actually think those two were more technically gifted than a lot of the, the players you described in the in the Rangers team. But were actually our retort to how Rangers were, were, were actually in the lead that season. And it was through blood, guts and thunder. Well, they had all that as well, but they also had quite a bit of ability uh, as well um, combined with that. Hartley was one of those folk who was, by that point, he must have been 31, and he was he was no longer the box-to-box midfielder he'd been before. In fact, mm-hmm. I don't remember many goals he scored for Celtic, to be honest. No, no. But, but that's, scored, a, yeah, but that's, that, that's another striking as of me. I mean, basically what Gordon Stratton actually done was when we signed Hartley, he was a box-to-box midfielder with with an eye for a goal. And he had a bit of devilment about him, eh? but 
Gordon Stratton actually turned him into a holding midfielder. Paul, when we signed Paul Hartley, he was the best box to box midfielder out with Celtic Park. We had right. Pet, we, we we had Pet off in that at that time as well. But he he was he was tearing up the Scottish Premier League being a box to box midfielder. He comes to Celtic Park and Gordon Stratton goes, "I'm going to play you as a deep lying midfielder." Unbelievable! <laughs> That's and like, you go and you go six years ago before that he's playing what. He's playing wide right for St Johnston. <laughs> like, he was a winger. I mean, what a mad, mad way for your your positions to sort of adapt. He also um, he also played at full back a couple of times as well. Did he? Uh, he also played at full. He, he wasn't very good at full back. He had no pace by the time no. he was actually play, playing full back. Eh? I mean, Hartley. I mean, he was a pain in the arse playing for Hearts against us. He always seemed to have great games against us in that, eh? And what I also loved about him, like, he was the type of guy who could have a shave in the morning and have a full beard beyond him. <laughs> 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 you, you could actually see his beard growing during games. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> I've never had that problem myself, I must uh, admit. Either, either, either that, eh? And, it, it was, and also, he was a Celtic fan. He right. was a Celtic fan. He never had the fact he was a Celtic supporter. Uh, there's a famous interview in a Mulwall fanzine when, he, when they asked him, what's your dream? And he goes to play for Celtic when he, when he, was, really? a young lad, when he was a young lad at, at Mulwall. Eh? That partner, as you say, but you, you summed up that partnership re- re- really, really well. Eh? And for them, Thank you. Thank they, you. They, they, they won us that league. You're talking about leaders on the pitch. You had McManus, who was the captain. You had Gary Caldwell and Folk Maling, Gary Caldwell. But the game that we've just spoke about, if he didn't have the guts to play the balls forward, we're not scoring the two goals. And Caldwell was, was a leader. I was going to yeah. touch on that as my wee piece. I thought, you know, Gary Caldwell frustrates the life out of me in interviews and that. Now I've got to be honest. I mean, when I hear him, I do. I don't particularly enjoy his punditry, if I'm being completely honest. I really don't. But... Back then, he did get a bit of jet prank and he was better than what he was. But that Rangers game, he got it right the two times he took a chance on passing. And again, it comes down to that confidence in your own ability, which I can annoy you if something doesn't come off. But are you going to spend a life playing safe? Because that'll get you nowhere in football, I don't think. You can't just play safe your whole career. Do you know what I mean? You've got to, you've got to take chances if you think it's going to make a difference. And again, you've got to then look at context, Kev. Mm-hmm. 91 minutes you're saying and he's going spraying one to the back post you tell me many cents I have staying that not many no 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 many would I mean I don't think there was an arrogance about Mankey I think the fact it, we were in a period of downsizing at that time and our centre half pairing were Stephen McManus and Gary Caldwell and that didn't sit well with a lot of Celtic fans. But Stephen McManus was a leader, Gary Caldwell was a leader, and you had two leaders in the middle of the park. You had four captains there, basically, in, in the middle of the park, because Barry Robson could have been a captain, and Paul Hartley could have been your captain 100%. as well. You, you, had, you, had four, you had four leaders there, and I think that sums up like Gordon Stratton Celtic. He liked good teammates, and I think, he, I think he says that numerous times. That like Paul Telford was a good teammate, a guy who was unspectacular. It was a team being made in the sum of its parts. That they, they were an a- actual team, and they got it right. We maybe weren't the greatest to watch, but I think Stratton's record now, when we look back on it in hindsight, is going. That was a good, that was a decent record that he had. Very good, very good, very good. I mean, three three in a row he won as well. Um, you know, and as you say, it's in a period of downsizing. I think mm-hmm. the fact he got that team in the last 16 of the Champions League twice as well is something that looks better and better as the years go on. It really does. And you look at who we're beating then as well. And this is this annoys me with football these days, Kev, right? Because everyone says, oh, you can't compete financially with them. And I'll get... Example what you gave earlier, Benny Gura a Dutch international at 27, right? And But you're going, but we also did score with a 700 grand guy for, for Motherwell against AC Milan, who had Nesta Maldini um, at the back. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you look at, you know, you look at that team, that Milan team, and you go, is that really any worse than what the best teams are in Europe now? 
I don't think so. They were just as elite of level of players as what elite level players are now. And we were still doing it with guys that were 700 grand from Motherwell that would still cost us 700 grand from Motherwell now. So I think we sometimes are sucked a wee bit too much into the old, the financial side of the game. Do you know what I mean? Want to know why, Russell? Want to know why? Because we were a well-coached side, an uh, organised side who knew their jobs. We went to the San Siro and we only got beat an extra time with a, with a cracking goal for Kaka, an absolutely peach, peach goal for Kaka. But that night we had Stephen Presley and a van der Snow playing for us. And we, Man, took, that is mad. And we took AC Milan to extra time. Yeah. And it shows you, if you've got a, a decent coach, manager, who knows how to set up and organise a team, you can do stuff. And maybe maybe we're, we're, we're doing the Borden Rangers side of that season a bit of discredit. Walter Smith knew how to organise a side. That's how they got to a UEFA Cup final. Yeah. It's because he knew how to organise a side. It's maybe too sterile, maybe too sterile for us who are all romantics and stuff like that when it comes to football. And Strat- but when you look back on it on Stratton's record, uh, we were lucky enough uh, earlier, uh, well, it was over a year ago now, to have a night with Gordon Stratton. Uh, Paul interviewed him and I was getting a free dinner in the audience. <laughs> and and, and um, it was a great night. It was a great night, and I think as times went on with Gordon Stratton, I think a lot of the Celtic support do not like him. It, maybe likes a bit too strong word, but appreciate what he done. As he says, he didn't become as a Celtic supporter, but he's leaving as a Celtic fan. And yeah. his two laddies work at Celtic as well. Gavin and he's got another laddie that works in the scouting department. Oh, really? I didn't know uh, that. So, when, when he's getting a bit narky on Celtic TV talking about uh, what the changes that are coming, he's just trying to protect his two laddies' jobs. Eh? Well, you know what I mean? I know, I that, That's how I laugh at some of the folks' reactions to him and going, well, his two laddies are um, employed at Park Cape, man. What do you want to say? Oh, aye. I aye. Love it. They, 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 they need to it. walk out the door. <laughs> See that striking? What's he doing with that iPad? Huh? <laughs> you know what I mean? No way, man. No oh, way. Oh, I know, I know. Oh, brilliant. I, I enjoyed That's one of my best games ever. That is one of my best games God, ever. I, 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 I just had so many great moments. Um, ho- hopefully get made of moments on Sunday and we'll, we'll be able to talk about them on Monday. We'll move on to the music, Russell, eh? Um, in the charts that week, number one in the charts was American Boy by Estelle. Do you I remember? Like the, aye. I quite the, like that. The catch me number that. It reminds me going out. It reminds me. It reminds me going out. And, and, and I was 20, 21 then. Do you know what I mean? It was always getting played wherever you went, in any, any club or whatever. So I suppose... I didn't mind that. I thought it was a right tune. If somebody would have said to me, is that song 13 years old? I would have went, nah, no danger, that's that's fair. That's five or six years old. And I always remember, aye, that's true. I always remember Kanye West with that song saying, Chain Belinga, and thinking, you're just, you get away with saying anything, man. <laughs> Chain Belinga. <laughs> Chain Belinga. <laughs> I was always like, you're, you're just pushing the boundaries of what you, like, folk like anything he does, man, at that point, you know what I mean? Chain Balinga. Uh, Chain Balinga. Uh, at number two was Black and Gold with Sam Sparrow. Again, I, I would. Again, I wouldn't have. Again, I wouldn't have thought that was thirteen years ago. I would never have thought that no, was thirteen no, no. years ago. Yeah. Um, at number six was Mercy by Duffy. That was a decent tune, produced yep, by Ber- tune. Produced by Bernard Butler. Um, was it? Aye. Bernard Butler produced that album. Uh, number 17, Something Good, Utah Saints. Always a classic, man. I don't know that. He, he did again Something Good be Utah Saints? No? I don't think so. Oh. I don't think so. I'll mate, need to mate, listen to it. Yeah, yeah, you'll need to listen to that. I, I, I reckon that you will... As soon as you play it, you'll recognise it. You will. You're going to get me the 
<laughs> no, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. And and in, in the album chart, uh, Duffy was number one with Rock Ferry. Yes, you said produced by Bernard Butler. Um, REM were number three with Accelerate. I know an album I'm I'm uh, familiar with. Truthfully, number four, the Cortinas with St Jude. Yeah, Cortinas man. Yeah, Cortinas man. I like, I mean, I, I like a few of the singles. I liked, uh, I, I think You Overdid It though was in the second album. I loved that when it came out. I thought it was a great single. Obviously not 19 Forever, it'll always be a festival classic, you know. But, but it's one of those ones, see not 19 Forever, my worry for it is it's going to become like LSF by Kasabian. When right. actually it just gets a wee bit karaoke-ish when you're at the festival and it'll actually probably start irritating the band. Do you get what I mean? By like going, mm. how many of you really are just here for that one song? Because <laughs> you've not given me a reaction for any of our new stuff. Or uh, some have. But I found LSF, I always remember, by Kasabian, just that, na, na, na. Like, it just getting a wee bit like, this is turning into a wee bit like, I don't know, pantomime or something. And I think the singing of the Not 19 Forever might just become, it might actually hold that band back in a way because I think it might just become oh we like the Cortinas for the festival for not 19 forever and there's probably a lot more to them than that Aye, uh, I've tried to get into the Cortinas and I, I just, I've listened to quite a few of their albums and I just didn't get it I, I, I just can't I don't know, oh, I just can't I, 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 just, I just can't really connect with it and I can see your point with LSF uh, LSF there. I've seen Kasabian quite a few times, eh? and I love that song. I really do. I think it's a great song, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if, if they ever come back now, Kasabian, as Kasabian. After, no. Uh, they, they can't really, you know. I don't think no. they can. No, it's pretty dark, that story. Like, that was, that was no nice at all, eh? No, no, it isn't, eh? But Again, a, a good festival band. Kasabian, a fantastic festival band. Um, I, I saw them, I think the last time I saw them was at the SEC. I think that was the last time that I, that I had seen them in. That was a, it was a decent night, or an all right night. For me, they're like the Primal Scream. If the Primal Scream had never made ex- uh, Exterminator, you would, you would never have had Kasabian. Because I think Kasabian are based an awful lot on, on that album, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Number 10 in the charts was Hey Ma Be James. That's a decent album if you've never listened to that, James. Oh, that, that, I mean, that that James. Was, that's one that I was swaying on talking about because I, but my worry was not as many folk would know about it, but I suppose that's... I mean, Hey Ma by James defined my flat for a long time. And, Did it? Uh, I looked at a guy called Shawnee Sherman, who's a huge fan of yours, by the way, Kevin. He'll be watching... He ain't sure brilliant, eh? So, Hiya, hey, Sean. Sean, eh? <laughs> but he, we'll tell you, I mean, we had Hey Ma on a lot at that time. I mean, the intro, the, the, the opening track is called Hey Ma on that. Mm-hmm. And when all the guitars kick in, it starts with a wee slow acoustic one. And then I was listening to one on that the other day. There's a few good tracks. Bubbles is really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, White Boy is really good. That's a, that's a good CD. I recommend that to anyone. That's when... James really got their mojo back, I think, with with, with that album. Oh, all the later stuff, all the stuff that, re- that they've released in the last 10 years has been brilliant. Every, ah, every single album has been brilliant. They've got a new album out this year. We've interviewed uh, Saul for James as well. Eh? Mm-hmm. There's, inter- there's interviews on the channel. Eh? And they were the first band that I ever saw at the Barrowlands was James, 1992. Really? Uh, I saw James at the Barrowlands. Eh? So they've, always, they've always got a bit in my heart, eh? I think I've seen them live 11 or 12 times it's up to now Aye. In, a, in a variety of places as well Kev so we went on a stag do right to uh, Carlisle for two nights I think it was right and we're coming back in the train and I always remember like the boy I'm going with is sitting just with his head like on, on the desk in the train like, I'm having a few beers again man I'm having a good wee time <laughs> and I'm, I've got the music on my phone. I think it was Sound and Vision by David Bowie playing. I'm, a, I'm singing away in that man. And he just goes, he just looks at me. He goes, who sings that? And I went, David Bowie. He goes, keep it that way. <laughs> but he said, <laughs> that, right? and uh, I said to him eventually, like, look, mate, we're all hanging. 
we're going to, oh, what was the name of the festival? It was like an old warehouse in a muddy field in the middle of nowhere, right? And we were having to get dropped off there by his sister's man. He was having to come pick us up later that night. It was a mission, the whole thing, right? On the back of a stag do, Kev. You're going, we didn't need this, mate. And he's like, we've got to go. I'm like, you're the one who's hanging. I mean, I'll be fine, but you're, you're the worst nick I've ever seen anyone in in my life. And he's like, I was like, you do Ken Tim Booth's not going to mind if you didn't go. Like, I was like, oh, and then I even offered to pay for his ticket for him <laughs> just to put him out his misery. So it was a surreal environment to be sitting in this muddy barn at the site, sitting down when James were on because we, we were dying, mate. Like, I tried to sort of get going in that, but he couldn't move. And I've got photos of the two just sitting on the floor like this. I've never sat down watching James in my life, you know what I mean? And I've also seen them. Uh, just to just to quickly talk about James, it just I seen them at the the Royal Concert Hall, and they did like a, a strings and choirs thing. Mm-hmm. So it was like I don't know eight folk in the choir, sixteen right. man strings. Section. It was like fifty five, sixty bucks for the ticket, which was a steep rise, is what they, they usually were, and that was sensational. And then I seen them play at the Toll Booth in Stirling, only aye, I know four aye. years ago. Mm-hmm. Four years ago, and that was really interesting to see them that intimate as well. And I've seen them countless times at the SECC, the Hydro, and all that as well, eh? and festivals. I haven't, I haven't seen them for a, a couple of years. I haven't seen them for a couple of years, truthfully. But I'll probably go and check them out when, as at the end of this year, I think they're touring with the Happy Mondays. Eh? That's the Happy right. Mondays are supporting. I, I will actually go and check that out because it's been ages since I've been to a gig. Um, it's funny that you say that you sat down, you sat, you were hanging and you were sitting down at a James gig. I went to see, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I went, I went to see Mogwai at the Usher Hall, and there was a guy sitting down next to us, and he shot himself. He was stinking, man, absolutely <laughs> rotten. He was, man. Whatever, oh. it, whatever he had took disagreed with me, and he, and he completely followed through. It was absolutely stinking, man. He got up and left quite quite soon after that. Why eh? think oh, oh, what a stinker, man! It was absolutely, absolutely stinking. Oh, oh no! Uh, right, oh, that, that 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 was you, eh? Kevin. I have that T-shirt for you that Saul gave me during the first lockdown. Thank you, Paul. Well, I, I'm sure I'll maybe pick it up now. We're, we're allowed to go back down to the studio from Friday, so I'm looking forward to going back down to the studio. Um, oh, man. Right, let's talk about the two albums that we're meant to be talking about. Number two in the album chart that week is Shine a Light, the, the original soundtrack by the Rolling Stones. Fire ahead, Russell. So I just think, I don't know how many opportunities we're going to get to talk about the Stones um, in terms of the years that we've went for so far. So I just felt that we needed to pay our respects to, for me, the band that I would have been more of a fan of in the 60s than, uh, than the Beatles, definitely. I know that will split opinion. No, it's, it's, uh, it, it will split uh, opinion. I mean, just obviously that's how they're both so big. But uh, I just think I've seen them live. We were talking about it all fair. I've seen them live like three years ago, four years ago. And you think back to this album, Shine a Light, and they were at, uh, better level probably than what they were by Murrayfield but yet Murrayfield when I seen them there three years ago my, I just wanted to tick it off the list I'll be honest I wasn't expecting I, I, I wasn't expecting to see them being brilliant by any stretch I actually thought it was going to be a lot more backing musicians doing a lot of the, the music and stuff but I watched a band that to me was still very much in their own uh in their, own, in their own zone, like, they were very much still as relevant a rock and roll band as I could be wishing to see and not just old guys coming out to play a couple of tunes. We know that I can say I've seen the Rolling Stones. I left there with a completely different vibe. I thought, no, that was actually still brilliant. And I just thought it was interesting when you look back to 2008. So I looked through, like, their discography and you look at, the longevity, first and foremost, of the Rolling Stones. How many albums between real uh, recorded albums and live albums they've actually had out is astonishing. I didn't count them all, but you were scrolling mm. for eternity. And to be honest with you, 
it was quite exciting because there was a few live ones that I hadn't known they'd done or I hadn't, it must have passed my, my ignorance, you know what I mean? But I just think uh, when we talk about all the amazing artists we have, we look at the Rolling Stones in 2008, number two in the charts with another brand new live album and just think, when will that, when will the love for the Stones ever end and what year will they ever release an album that doesn't go into the top five in its first week of release? Even a live one, you know what I mean? I, I was I went to see them at Murrayfield that night as well, uh, and, and as you say, they were, they were utterly fantastic from huh? the moment the moment they started. We started up to yep. and it was a, an hour and forty odd minutes that they done. It was it was close to close to two hours that they done, and obviously like Mick Jagger disappeared for a couple of songs and all of that just to go in his chamber and get oxygen blasted or whatever he actually get does. But back, Drinks back to jail. Aye, um, aye, but but as soon as you saw Mick Jagger doing that wiggle doing the platform, you went, "I'm quite glad there I came go. here." <laughs> I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite glad I came here. Um, they, they'd headlined Glastonbury a couple of years before that, and I was always a bit wary of going to see these bands. And all, 1997, the Who was it 97 or 98? It was a day after we lost the league at Celtic Park, and. Uh, Hugh Dallas had got hit with a coin. All the guys that I hung about with at that point were going to see the Who at the SEC. And I was, it was a month, it was a bank holiday Monday, and I said, I'm not going to see the Who, man, a bunch of old fuddy duddies, blah, blah, blah. And I wished to HUD now because it was, a, obviously, Moon was dead, eh, but Entwistle was there. Eh? But I went to see the Who in 2014 at the Hydro, and they were utterly fantastic. As soon as you see Pete Townsend doing that windmill, you're like, aye, yeah, I'm quite glad I'm here. And they go through the Tommy stuff and the Quadrophenia stuff and all of that. Um, absolutely fantastic. And I almost regret not going to see the, the Who in 97. So I was watching the, the Glastonbury Festival and the Rolling Stones headlined it. And I, I, says to, I says to my wife, I says, we're gone when they're playing in Scotland. We're getting tickets. I didn't I don't care how much it is. I'm going to, we're definitely, I'm, I was a bit like you. I'm going to need to go and tick off going to see the Stones. I'm not going, to make, the, I'm, I'm not going to make the same mistake I made with the Who and, and uh, Jim Hannaway comes in in 99. I'm not going to make that mistake and go to see, well, they're not the original band, obviously, but... They're a band that's got the most original members, eh? The, and I, eh? and I was glad I went. It's like, but it's like a, it's a, it's a brand, eh? Everybody buying the t-shirts, and you couldn't get near the t-shirt stalls, and it's like, it's an utter, it's like a shot, it's like a shopping like center. The, 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 the Globe Trotters are saying the Harlem Globe Trotters, like they are, just, they're more than just like. Aye. A band, when you go there, you're, you're everyone buys into the full Stones package. And, and like Aye. I'm saying, it's, when do you think that's going to... That's not going anywhere ever until, until they're dead. They're getting... They're still... They could sell a world tour tomorrow like that. Easy oh, they could. Oh, oh, definitely. Easy yeah. And I, uh, I just think... I just felt, for me, when I seen their name on the list, I just felt it was number two in the chat. I just thought, firstly, that's nearly, what, 40 years... Since the first time they'd appeared that high on album chart, if not more than that, aye, more than that, over 40 years. Uh, and secondly, they're still, as I was saying, when I was going through the dis- discography, or how do you say that one? Is that, is that how you think? Discography, are you right, you're right. Aye, like, when will that ever end? And, and I think it's important to, when we're doing this, to, 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 to take you to, when a big band like that's involved, you've got to kind of, Pay homage, my man, because I think you've uh, got to, man. Aye, I, I'm, I'm no, I'm no snobby anymore about all these old, old bands coming back now, which I was in 1999. Jim, <laughs> ha- Jim Haddo in the comments quite rightly says, "Tick them off last Murrayfield gig." Uh, Richard Ashcroft supporting. That's now, right. Did, did you laugh when he started playing Bittersweet Symphony, Ken, and that the Rolling Stones have stole all the royalties for years for that songs off him? Well, the, the only reason Richard Ashcroft did the gig is because they made up. Aye, because they got because he got the he got the rights back. Eh? He got the rights back, but nothing backdated. Aye, nothing I backdated. The stones like how much money, more money do you can we make off it? I didn't hear it there. <laughs> Twenty years, son. 
<laughs> Aye, I know. But, and what, 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 what was it? Uh, is it Keith Richards says, I will take the money and he should come back to us if he can write a song as good. <laughs> well, you know, though, it's interesting. So, there is on YouTube talking about this, right? Another song where they reckon the Stones bumped it from. That would probably be right. That would right. probably be right. It's more of a sort of soul song, and I can't remember the name of it. But you hear it in the background, and then so if you put into like YouTube, like the development of Better Street Symphony or the the, the transition of Better Street Symphony, you hear the very first one. It's not even the Stones. Mm-hmm. There you go, and it Aye. sounds but, mega. I mean, everything they done was ripped off blues. So uh, it was the same with the Who, early Who, and that as well. Eh? Some somebody asked. Uh, Pete Townsend once, how did the Who get their sound? And he says, because we were rubbish at playing the blues. <laughs> he says, it, it, it was our take on what, what we actually thought the, blue, the, the blues were. Eh? As we're talking about legends of music, um, we'll go to Amy Winehouse. What's, what's, uh, you, you wanted to bring up uh, Amy Winehouse this week, so... Let's, well, I like the parallel there. universes that we go down, Kev. I mean, I'm not going to sit and say I'm the biggest Amy Winehouse fan of all time or anything. But I think you've got to pay tribute to the fact that that was a someone who, if you look at the next, how the next 15 years could have played out, um, how amazing would it have been? Not because I'm the biggest Adele fan or anything like that, but she is a global superstar, right, that Adele or whatever. She has no two ways about it. She could sell records anywhere. Imagine like her and Amy Winehouse having a record out at the same time. It'd be brilliant, mm-hmm. man. And I think... Amy Winehouse would have had a glass number of headline set in her easy days, like a, like an iconic one, one that really stood the test of time. And I just thought when I seen that album there, I love the song Tears Dry on the Road. I think that's one of my that's my favourite song that she's on by an absolute mile. Um I just think, you know, how many albums could we be talking about now? Um because the thing was Amy Winehouse's music, it wasn't pop or anything no. like that. It's really, really soulful. It is Produced the right way, her voice is iconic as it is amazing, and I, you just think I, I, we always do what what could have been, and I wonder right now. But the flip side is, can you take certain sides to people's personality away from? Can you dilute them, and you get the same product at the end, or is the reason it was so that the vocal so raw, it's got so much attitude in it because of perhaps some of her lifestyle choices at the time. She was a bit, you know, raw. And I think it's an interesting one, but if 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 if, if she hadn't passed away so tragically, I think that there would have been, you could be talking about someone who, you know, already gets an amazing status in that, but I think you could be talking about someone right up there in terms of British female uh, artists, like, of all time. I think you're right, and, and the greatest compliment I can give Amy Winehouse is like, if somebody asked me now when was her peak, I couldn't tell you when she was in the early 2000s. If somebody says what year was Amy Winehouse massive, I'll be like, I couldn't tell you because because her music. because her music is still as big today as what it was at that time. And, great way of it. and I, I, I think that. Long longevity is is a test of time there with Amy yeah. Winehouse, and it's always it's the same when you've got the, the other ones that joined the Twenty Seven Club. That's a great podcast, by the way. If anybody's looking for a good podcast to, to listen to, there's a podcast called the Twenty Seven Club, which is like a sort of true crime podcast about rock stars who died when they were twenty seven. And so you've got Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, eh, Kurt Cobain all died when they were 27. And so uh, that so it makes you wonder what all these artists might have done when they when they if they would have lived past past that age. Would could you actually see Nirvana doing the Rolling Stones now? Could you see Nirvana still uh, selling out stadiums then then uh, sell, smells like Team Spirit. I, I, I mm-hmm. can't. I, I can't see I, that. I don't, think, I, I don't think he liked the vibe I always got was he didn't like the Stones to me <laughs> definitely as we just spoke about being the full package quite like the world that they're in that environment whereas I don't think 
I can imagine Kurt Cobain sticking out 30 years, 40 years in no. the limelight as such. I don't think that was his, his bag as much. That's the vibe I get. I mean, I don't know that much about him, but that was the, the impression I got was he, that was the side to see if he could just be making music and getting paid for it handsomely, but not actually having a day or the, all the stuff that goes with that. I the, think the, 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 all the stuff that Dave Grohl loves with the Foo Fighters. <laughs> 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 so true eh? um, aye, uh, it's, I always remember a quote an early early quote uh, by Noel Gallagher he says oh, I, I can't see me at 50 doing this and what age is he now he's in his 50s still still doing the, still doing the live gigs left right and centre eh? oh, so aye. I think if it's in your blood it's in your blood eh um, I, I was going to talk about Elbow, but I think after the Rolling Stones and Amy Winehouse, I don't think we can actually go to Elbow on, after, after that. <laughs> um, DB comes in. Kevin Graham, you were really rude to the Helms delivery guy on the last podcast. Aye, I know it was, but we, I spoke to him the following day and we've made up and he delivered a nice pair of trainers to me the following day. So but we're all cool. Me and the Helms guy are cool. So it's been sorted. It's been, it's sorted. been sorted. I didn't, didn't worry about that. He apologised as well. <laughs> um, he did apologise. Right, my, my album that I'm going to talk about this week is the Seldom Seen Kid by Elbow. Um, I really loved this album when it came out, and, and it came out in, in April 2000, 2008, and it was the first Elbow album I, I, I really got into. And I didn't really get into it because of the big song on it one day like this. Uh, they had a single before it called Grounds for Divorce, which I really, really loved. And uh, and I understand why people... I, I like... I've said this plenty of times. And the Stones were the same, and Amy Winehouse is the same. It's taking something simple and making it so good. Something like it's... If you listen to Elbow, it's sparse. It's a bit like spiritualised. It's sparse. But they make it sound massive, and for mm. me, that's really, that's really really difficult to do. It's really difficult to do something so simple and make it sound it sound so big. Um, and I, I I really got this album at the time, uh, and it's one of these albums where if you listen to it on headphones, it's been it's been mastered a certain way that there's sounds coming everywhere because the way that they've mastered it. Eh? I, I think it's a really good album. And obviously, I'm, I'm a bit of a, uh, I like to think I'm a bit of a writer, but uh, I love the lyrics. I love the, I, I love the way, uh, I love the lyrics and the, the, the way that he paints, the, the way that uh, Guy Garvey actually paints pictures on this album. It's It was one, it's one of my favourite albums um, uh, this year, of that year, definitely. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. No, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, it's like to me, it's a bit like um, they're a bit like in comedy, like the like Michael McIntyre. Do you know what I mean? It's just like family PG music. Do you know what I mean? It's just just I can, I can, I, uh, I, I, can, I can understand that. I can understand that because one day like this. If if you're a creative person, a songwriter, a book writer, or anything like that, your your aim is to kind of write something that takes on a life of its own. The streets the, the streets done it with dry your eyes. He'll admit that song doesn't belong to him anywhere because even though he's wrote it, it's that massive. It's got a life of its own. One day like this has got a life of its own. You've, you've seen it too many times. Like when England have won a decent game of football, it was the, the 2008 Olympics. It was used all the time on that. It's been used on children in need. It's been used on so many things. And you see their Glastonbury performances when they're getting everybody to wave and all of that. And it just a feel good thing. With. And I actually think it devalues their music. <laughs> When they become that sort of pantomime, like festival it, band. It reminds it? me of the type, the type of song a middle class family would be having their class on in fresh orange on a Sunday morning listening to. Aye, ah, it's probably like <laughs> music. It's music for these folk who kid on that they like music. <laughs> <laughs> like. So I'll be on in the background when they're having their like avocado prawn sandwiches or something like that. Aye, Aye. And, like I understand. I've got a load. Of, I've got a load of friends who are the type of people who don't like avocado. music. <laughs> uh, eat avocados as well. <laughs> aye, uh, who who don't like music. But if you listen to 
they have a go on their phone and look at their Spotify playlist. One day like this will be on it. Uh, that, will, that will be on it and there'll be other staples of, oh look, I'm alternative, I'm cool, will be on their playlist. But they, they, have, they, wouldn't have a, they wouldn't have a clue about all the rest of it. I mean, if I say to them, oh, what about grounds, grounds for Divorce by Elbow? They'll go, oh, I've never heard that song. But well, it's on the same bloody album. It's a better song. Uh, and and, and I, 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 done a, I, done a, I done a poem, a Tommy Burns poem, and it's on my Twitter feed and that. I've watched that. And for me, and I'm not going to say that it's up there with fucking dry your eyes and all of that, eh? But that that's no longer mine. That that has now got a life of its own. And that's I mean, I've done it quite a few times. I've done it to massive audiences and that. And when people come up and speak to me about that, it's... It's their memories, and what are, my words take them to somewhere else. And yeah. that for for now, for me, I understand to a small, small, small smidgen level of what Mike Skinner and that mean when they say right. and that's that's no longer mine. It would be the same way Irvin Welsh with Train Spot, and they go, "Well, that's no longer my book. That's that's the world's book. That's mm-hmm. so I understand what I mean, and understand why people would have." that sort of feeling about elbow myself. I, I sometimes think they didn't do themselves justice right enough, but... I always um, hated the fact when he, when he played live, he had, like, rolled up sleeves in. I, I know we liked, he, he, it. We liked he, it when Paul Hartley and Barry Robson did it, but I'm not having, I'm not having him <laughs> out there with uh, Ringo Jumper, do you know what I mean? I'm like, come uh, on, man. Uh, Plenty the, the, 50, the, the, and folk and you've got, like, the rolled up wheelie jumper. We're not we're cotton or whatever, what type of wheel jumper. It's like, come on, man, cashmere. And rolled up sleeves, just like, just nah, no having it, man. Uh, it's like a Tory party conference, about eh? <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> right. So the night I've I, I, I says I've liked dinner party music, and I'm a, and I couldn't be an outlaw because I shat it. So I think I think we'll I think we'll end it there. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we will end it there. Brilliant, right. Loved it, uh, Kev. Uh, brilliant. Uh, we'll be back again next week at half past six, and hopefully, um, we'll be back on Monday. Hopefully, we'll have something to celebrate on Monday. Uh, but we'll be back here on Tuesday night to have a laugh anyway. So, thanks very much for tuning in. Give us a like, give us a follow. 